This is going to be a really exciting worldview and belief. We've got Oli back. He's the premier investigator on false flags. And he's been really working day and night on this Paris thing. So we're going to learn a lot about what went on, why and how this thing happened. So welcome Oli Damagard to World Beyond Belief. It's good to have you back. Thank you so much, Paul. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be back. Well, why don't we start? The last time we talked to you, you were with Zen. We talked a little bit about possible false flags coming up uh, mm -hmm. to watch, to watch out for. And then this thing comes up. Yeah, it's like, uh, I thought, I think we recorded on the 10th of, 10th. Uh, no, uh, of uh, November. Uh, and I thought that it was going to happen in Denmark on the 11th, because there was a major drill there at the Copenhagen University. There was also a major drill outside Copenhagen, where they were, so sort of the, the theme of the drill was an atomic uh, incident with two big vessels, two ships colliding and so on. But uh, uh, if you remember in, in uh, January, the beginning of this year, uh, that we first had an attack in Dublin on Ireland, then Charlie Hebdo happened in the beginning of January, and then uh, because I had come over information about the upcoming uh, attacks, I went out publicly and predicted the Copenhagen shootings one day, uh, one month exactly on the hour before it happened. I even pointed out uh, where it was going to happen and so on. And uh, so, I've spent some 30 years looking into these things, so I'm, I'm trying to, from my experience, predict so we can stop this madness, predict and expose what's going on. So I thought it was going to happen in Copenhagen. I had people on site there filming the drill uh, while they were setting it up and so on with the, with the intention of exposing it before it even happened. But in the case of January, it was Paris first, Copenhagen then. Here was Copenhagen first, then Paris. It was two days later, boom, it happened. Yeah. I thought in Denmark it was the 11th of the 11th, but instead they hit on Friday the 13th instead. So, so if it's okay with you, can I just go through quickly the official story, what happened, and then we can step by step have a look at the different incidents and see if it makes sense, the official story, or if there are things that comes up that could point towards something else going down. That sounds like a good way to proceed. Go ahead, Oli. Okay. okay, so on Friday the 13th, 2015, there was a, a big football game going on, a soccer game in, the, in central Paris at a stadium there. And around 9.22 in the evening, uh, it was between France and Germany, and the two, at 9.22 around there, suddenly a, an explosion were heard uh, outside the stadium. Then a few uh, minutes later, boom, a second explosion was going on. Uh, the French pre president was there with some uh, colleagues from Germany and so on. But just, um, it, is there, it is said there that uh, two suicide bombers had tried to get into the stadium, didn't uh, succeed, and then decided to blow themselves up outside the stadium. Then just a few minutes uh, later, there was a shooting at uh, two small bar restaurants uh, places, one called Le Carillon and the other one Le Petit Cambodge. And it said that there were 14 people killed there. Then a few more minutes later, there was shooting in the area of Avenue de la République. And it said that there were five deaths there at the Cosa Nostra Pizzeria. Then uh, a few more minutes later uh, than that, there was a shooting at a bar called Le Belle Equipe, and it said that there were 19 deaths there. Then at uh, 9.43, there was an explosion at Comptoir Voltaire, uh, with one death, and then 9.49, there was uh, the main event of the evening, so to speak, where four gunmen went into a music theater called Bataclan, and opened fire into the crowd. There was an American band called the uh, Eagles of Death Metal playing. And it said that these four shooters kept reloading and just firing into the crowd. And the crowd was uh, consisting of between 1,000 and 1,500 people. 
the result was that uh, at least 80 people were killed there. And then at 10 p.m. it said that there was a shooting at Boulevard Boulmarché, where four deaths were reported. So in total, the whole uh, time that, it, that elapsed really, except for the last shooting, was 33 minutes from start to end. And uh, there was a massive big uh, thing going on. Uh, the whole world has uh, reacted uh, with uh, martial law, terror alerts everywhere, all kinds of, of new measures against terrorism put in. Uh, in the airport's checklist for where every single passenger has to be checked against a uh, terrorist list. Uh, in the UK, they went out and said, uh, we need 1,900 more jobs for the MI5, MI6, the GCHQ, and other secret services. Uh, in high alert and uh, terror alert in Sweden, there are massive drills everywhere. Singapore, New York, Toronto, you name it so many places where people had suddenly seen police in the street, military vehicles in the street, uh, people walking around like uh, Ninja Turtles, SWAT teams, uh, yeah. all of these things, tanks and so on. And the most uh, violent result of this has been that right even before the identities of the people that are accused to have carried this out, uh, even before they were uh, confirmed, attacks against Syria, bomb attacks against Syria, was carried out. And uh, so, a very, very violent day, a very dark day in the history of the world, I would say. A mini 9 11. And uh, so, the question is here was it the work of eight, at least eight, uh, terrorist from ISIS, which the official story says, because in that case, we're up against a terrorist organization that is trying to attack the Western world uh, as, an, as a revenge of the, what's going on in Syria and so on. Right. Or are we looking at a possible force flag operation? And in that case, who is behind it? So, and for, for your listeners and those who, uh, who are not aware of what a force flag is, uh, operation is. It is an old naval term uh, from the old days when, uh, for instance, the, a big na a nation, if they wanted to just invite a small country or take over an island or whatever, rape and plunder and so on, they could just do that just with pure force. But that sometimes caused problems with trade agreements and, and so on. So it was a lot better if they, instead of being the attacker, turned themselves into the victim. Right. So what they did was they put the enemy's flag on one of their own ships and let that ship attack themselves and say, oh my God, we're under attack. Right. And then we are just defending ourselves, thereby if totally justifying entering, invasion, rape, plunder, death and destruction, the whole shebang. And even sometimes coming out as the hero because Oh, yeah. we were the ones on the attack and we just had to do anything to defend right. ourselves. Now, this has been used again and again and again through history. I mean, so many times, so, so many times. Also, the, the pirates took up this thing as well, and they thought, great idea, because it's a matter of deception. So what they did instead was like, if they were going to attack a Dutch ship, for instance, they just put a Dutch flag on their ship, down with a Scotland right. Dutch flag, with a Dutch flag, then so that they could get really close to the, the ones that they were gonna the rape the, the plunder the ship without being attacked in any way or form. So it is a different name of deception. So and it's also based on old Roman templates. And the ones that we've been talking about so many times is problem reaction solution. Here here is the one we have to become aware of. Because what I'm suggesting is that uh, over, over the generations and decades and decades and decades, there's always been a small group of people who thought that they were a lot better than the rest of us. And they decided, we will uh, rule you, the, the useless leaders, you will become our slaves and you will do whatever we say. But the question I've always been, even from the Roman Emperor and, and all the time up until now, 
how to do that? How can you control the masses if you are only a, a small little right. group? The answer is through fear. Fear or an outer enemy. You need to create an outer enemy. So an, an enemy that creates a lot of terror and so on to freak the population out so that the population will turn towards the elite few, or at least they call them the elite few, uh, themselves, and say, please, please save us. We're under attack. We're under attack. And then that will justify their solution. Then they will come with their solution as a to solve the problem. Right. And we're just accepting it, saying thank you, thank you for helping us or saving us, not understanding that they are actually the ones who caused it. Problem, reaction, solution. This is super important to understand. Because once you see that, once you see how that is done, you will see it being repeated again and again and again. So the thing that I was able to publicly predict, I also humbly believe that I exposed and stopped, defused more than one false flag massacre. It's not because I'm, I got a crystal ball, it's just because I know what a false flag pie smells like. Right. I know the ingredients, I know how they bake it, and I know their timeline, I know their agenda, and just because of that, because I've done this for some 30 years on my own, that's the only reason. So. Here we are, 2015, and I've been saying for a long time that 2015 is the year when this whole thing is going to come together and where, inshallah, we're going to transcend this problem, transcend it to the next level. Because it is like a cancer growth that is trying to kill us. We think that, many people think that the world is totally mad and filled with terrorists and terrorism and bombs going right. off and, and all of these things. I would say absolutely not. We live in a super beautiful universe. I mean, most of us, when we look out the window, it is fantastic. Right. Nature and harmony, everything is beautiful. But when you put, when you turn on this black box in front of you, you're being hit with this information stream like a sewage opening right in front of your eyes, pumping you with fear. Right. Saying fear, 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 we're under attack, we're under attack, the world is going on, the nature is going on, the mother earth is dying, Ebola virus, uh, swine flu, wars, ISIS, Al Qaeda, you name it, it's just being pruned from all different sides at the same time. So I thought that uh, they really tried to get us uh, around September uh, this year, where the end of J. Hell. 15, right. where the NATO exercises were really, uh, you know, uh, pumping up into like a massive big uh, final scene. They were aiming at crashing the financial situation and other things around the 23rd of September. Turned out to be an absolute massive part. Smelled awful, but was not there. Right. Did not happen. Why? Because of people. This kind of programs that you're doing, people like myself and so many others yes. who are part of exposing it, pumping it out, pumping it out, the information. What's going on? What's going on? Look in the correct direction, see and put the spotlight at the people carrying it out. Instead of focusing on minorities or people of the Muslim faith and so on, which we're being told, because these are the outer created enemies. That's right. It's almost like they weaponized Islam. Right. So, so that just the mentioning of the word Islam will make your subconscious think terrorism. Right. And if your name is Abdul, you will nowadays think terrorism. Right. It's come to that, that point. They've weapon. They've spent the last 50 or 60 years weaponizing the Islamic community. They poured in massive oil money into Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, to set up these schools to radicalize this particular, this particular faction. Because you have to have factions if you're going to have a war. So to create this faction... Yeah. And the thing is that most people have not been on... Yeah, I would say most people have not been to Muslim countries. If you live in a Western European or American country, you haven't been there. I've been to many of them. 
I was getting scared when I got into Iran. I thought they're, they're, they're going to be totally crazy running around screaming Allah Akbar, shooting yeah. each other. They were the most beautiful, generous, kind, and damaged. I mean, I was there damaged. during the war. There was a lot of damaged people. No wonder these poor people were right in the middle of an, a global chessboard where they were just being targeted and massacred. So right. no wonder that there was very extreme things going on and so on. Right. And it's the same with the people. You go to Iraq, you go to Syria, you go to Lebanon, you go to Libya, you go to... Uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just lucky, but I've just met a lot of very beautiful people. Very nice, very generous, friendly, sometimes strange, because I mean, we're from different cultures, we right. don't look the same, and so some big deal. That does not say that they're there to totally blow us up just because they feel like it. Right. And please understand also that I don't know how many millions of Muslims there are in the world, but it's like so many. And how many are actually even blamed to carry these things out? It's a fraction, fraction. Right. And I would say most of them are made up, not real at yeah. this point. That's right. Tell us about this one. Yeah. This this stage thing. Okay, so I've gone through what happened this day. It was an absolute awful day. So let's ha let's look step by step and see either I'm totally wrong by suspecting that this is a false flag, or there could be something pointing towards that. When you look at false flag operations, you have to see what happened and what didn't happen. It's just as important to see what did not happen because this is where suddenly communication systems are shut down, CCTVs doesn't work and work perfectly. They've got all these high-tech super duper systems with backup and everything so it cannot fail and yet when these things happen, boom, suddenly boom, none of them works. None and so on. Also, you have to be aware of that when these big operations are carried out, if it is a false flag, then possibly the so-called victims are part of the operation. These are CIA assets, Mossad assets, MI6 people and so on. The people being into you might be assets. The people running around in SWAT teams might be assets, so-called crisis actors. The witnesses might be crisis actors and so on. So what we are possibly looking at is like a theater play being played out right in front of your eyes to create an illusion of absolute terror so that we will go, oh my God, and then boom, in comes their solution. So we have a look and some of the countries uh, in this, you have to look at the secret networks like the Bilderberg Group and the Triathlon Commission. Council on Foreign Relations, these things going way up in the power pyramid and beyond. This is beyond national borders. It's not a matter of what France are doing or Germany or England. We're looking at hand-picked people in key positions pulling the strings behind the curtains, being controlled by people even higher up that we don't even know who they are. Who they are. Or people, I don't know what it is up there. I just know that the mindset behind all of this is totally crazy and the exact opposite of what we have. Right. So we look at this uh, game. There was a whole stadium filled with people. The, the French president was there, Francois Hollande, and everything was going great. And then suddenly you hear, boom. Some minutes later, boom, a second explosion. So what happened? Well, the official story said that there were three alternative two suicide bombers that came there with the mission of blowing themselves up to make a statement. Unfortunately, one of them had got, uh, bought a ticket. So that was a bit of a bomber when you can really blow yourself up. And so, so due to his lack of ticket, uh, the security there turned him away. So the second suicide bomber said, okay, I'll join you. And let's, then let's blow ourselves up on the outside, making absolutely no impact or whatever, but it's worth to sacrifice our lives for. So they blow themselves up. Only one problem, there is not one single photo of any 
detonation, any anything of where they blew themselves up. I've been to war zones. I tell you, if you've seen somebody hit by a grenade, it is gruesome. Yeah. There would be teeth, there would be part of brains hanging in the yeah. trees, there would be intestines, blood everywhere. It looks all, I mean, horrific. Here, I've seen one photo of one, it's a, like, you know, on a wall, and there are two drops of blood. That's the total as far as I know. Okay. So another one, um, another thing is that uh, when these black ops are carried out, they very often shut down the communi communication system in that area so that they, the people behind the operation, can be totally sure that their version gets out there first before normal people get any kind of uh, input. So uh, when JFK was taken out, the national phone system in the whole of the US went down for one solid hour. When 9-11 went down, same thing, the, the, the Twin Towers went down. They said it was because there was a, the, a, a telecommunication mask was on one of the towers. Absolutely not true because there were more. I mean, we're talking Central New York, come on. Yeah, yeah. 7-7 seven, bombings, seven same thing there. Madrid bombings, same thing there. When MS Estonia was blown up, same thing there. And so it's standard procedure. And here people at the stadium said that a few minutes into the game, suddenly their phones that didn't work anymore. Okay. Typical. So that, let me let me ask you a question. Uh, it's the official story that the guy didn't have a ticket, and so they yeah. blew themselves outside up outside. Yeah. Does that seem as ridiculous to you as it does to me? I mean, you're going to sacrifice your life. You're strapping a bomb on. You're going to go into a soccer game, but you don't have a ticket. I mean. It's Paul, we, ha we haven't even started. I haven't saved, your, saved my code. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, when this happened, they locked the, the exits so that everybody was uh, locked in at the stadium. I would say, when it comes to uh, from a security point of view, what told them that there were no suicide bombers on the inside already? So by locking Blocking the exits, you could, you know, you could create a, a total massacre. But that's what they did anyway. So nowadays, uh, especially in the U.S., when there's uh, all kind of ba uh, basketball games or, or baseball and so on, what they started to do to get a better feeling in the crowd zone is to add digital crowd noise through the PA system, so that you got people cheering and all of these things. Uh, when there's no cheering going on. And that's also when you see on TV, that's added there, and so on. So, uh, and there's been a lot of discussions, is this ethically right to do this? And I've seen teams practice in an empty stadium, but the crowd noise is there. So my question is, is it possible that this noise, the explosions were done, just added to the PA system? So that you just heard explosions, but you didn't, since there's no signs of them at all. Anyway, so we have uh, uh, President uh, uh, Francois Hollande. Do you remember when George Bush uh, Jr., he, he received the news that uh, a plane had hit one of the towers. Right. His advisor came, whispered in his ear, and he was listening to some school children reading out a story about a boat. Right. So he thought, uh, uh, it's just the worst terror attack ever on American soil, but this in, this story is so interesting, so I want to hear the end of the right. joke story first. Right. He's right. sitting there, not reacting, no ter no emotion on his face, nothing, just wanting to hear the end of the story, and then he's let out. Then we have Francois Hollande, and he's sitting there, there's photos taken, professional photos taken, when the advisor comes, whispers in his ears, no reaction, no emotion, nothing. Instead, he's let out from the stadium uh, up the stairs. It's not that bodyguards are jumping. I mean, look at any American movie nowadays. If the president is attacked, they jump him. Everybody is oh, yeah. lying on top of him. Oh, yeah. You know, protecting him with their yeah. bodies. Here, gently let out. So if 
if there is a suicide attack or a terrorist attack, you would assume that the president could be a possible target, I would say. But here we have him walking up to the to the commentator booth, you know, with panoramic glass windows, not bulletproof as not far bulletproof, as I know, right? where he's standing in front of the whole stadium making a phone call. So if somebody with a rocket launcher or a terrorist inside the stadium would want to kill him, that would be very spectacular indeed, I would say. But anyway, so also nowadays when there are black ops, they often have different celebrities there to, to make mark the impact or to add to the impact. Or there's a similar story at the same day with some kind of emotional thing, you know, like when with the mass shooting where in Norway, yeah. then the death of Amy Winehouse were on the same front pages and so on. Very sp suspicious circumstances around her death. And also, when you see the dates, uh, I mean, there's this ritualistic thing underneath, very satanic, dark thing behind these different operations. So, uh, but anyway, here I was just sitting waiting, who's it gonna be, who's gonna be, and here he came. It was a um, uh, talk show host, Geraldo Rivera, whose daughter, daughter. Uh, out on Fox News, and his daughter, Simone, had been, first they said she was inside the concert hall when this started, but uh, Geraldo corrected it and started saying, no, no, he, she was at the stadium. She mentioned three explosions, there were only two. Uh, she said that as they started to leave, SWAT teams and emergency crowds came in, Absolutely not true. If you see the footage that are from the inside of the, of the stadium, nothing. Then she also said that the, they saw the crowds pouring out from another exit and total chaos erupted. Absolutely not true. In the dead calm, nothing is happening. People uh, after the game, nobody understood what happened. The team players saw it on, on the internal TV screens and so on after the game. But everybody was like in there, so many people came down on the lawn and were walking around. But no photos, no videos, nothing. I've not seen a single photo from the inside except the official cameras and so on. Right. We're only talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people with mobile phones, with cameras, videos and so on. There's, there's a footage of one guy taking a selfie. Otherwise than that, that's it. And no footage from the people when they left the stadium. I mean, wouldn't you sort of like go to exit J sure. and just say, oh, us here, he blew himself up. <laughs> Look when people are passing a, 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 a traffic accident. I mean, people can't get enough of it. That's here, right. So. so if I can point out some odd things about this whole thing, because you're gonna see that this whole thing is so bizarre that I, I wanna just point things out and then after that, a while you can start seeing that maybe there's a pattern here or something. When you look at the game itself <laughs> and you, you zoom in on uh, frame by frame by frame when the explosion goes off, suddenly you, you have the players on this uh, green lawn. When the explosion goes off, the frames around there, some of them are missing their heads, there's some of them missing feet and something like a really crude CGI job, you know, like film job, not very professional. And also, I mean, very odd to say the least, also up in the left corner, when the first explosion or the second, I'm not sure which one, I think it's the first one, uh, do you know there are like, uh, uh, what is it called? Board, boards on a bit of, you no, know, no, what are these uh, boards on the side saying? Uh, billboards. 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 Digital billboards on the sides, you know, where they change the commercials and so on. Right. And here, we have uh, up in the left corner, you will see there's uh, the German flag, the colors of the German flag. And then it says, we are sind zusammen, which means we stand together, which is all more or less the slogan that they used after this whole thing. We, the nation against terrorism, we have to unite against terrorism. And it's, it's right there. And then when, the, when an explosion goes off, it fades out into the colors, white, yellow, and orange, just like an explosion and then into, uh, I think it's the name of the teams and so forth. Maybe a coincidence, maybe it's part of a cycle. 
okay, because uh, just uh, I think it was the very next day or hours later, it said that uh, Angela Merkel, uh, the leader of West Germany, she was said to be uh, bad to go to a football game in Hannover. I mean, how often do presidents go to these friendly games? They do not. I don't think but so. It said that she is supposed to be there, but then they found out that an ambulance filled with explosives were planned to be driven into the stadium to blow them up. Same thing, different countries are pumping up to add to the emotional impact that we're all under attack. And you know, on the morning of the, the same, very same morning, uh, François Hollande was on the phone with Obama, uh, which is also a key person who is right after that he was there. This is not an attack on France, this is an attack on all of us. It's a yeah. global attack. We're all in war, at war. Yeah. You know, how to include all of us. That's right. So, um, let's move on a little bit. Okay. When you look at Look at these. Uh, please interrupt if you got things, but otherwise I'll just. Uh, no, no, I, I don't have any questions. But I was going to interject that the week before there, there was a big intelligence meeting in France, and it included the CIA, the Mossad, and French intelligence. Well, it, was, it was at the George Washington University, and it was, uh, was it in? there was a um, it was the Cyber and Homeland Security who had a panel called the Shared 21st Century International Mission. Everyone who knows about military people and so on, they know a mission is an operation. The Shared 21st Century International Mission. And the people in the panel were CIA Director John O'Brien, former MI6, uh, UK MI6 Chief John Sawyers, uh, Director of the French Directorate for External Security, Bernard Bajoulet, and former Israeli National Security Advisor, Yaakov, I mean, here are the people who we could suspect to be part of a thing like this. Right. And there they are meeting officially. So what were they speaking about when they were not on stage? Also, when this drill was in Copenhagen, there were other foreign people from security agencies in Copenhagen giving public speak talks. And by the way, it was co-hosted this thing by the CIA. So, and this was held either on the 27th or the 29th of October, just a week or two before this all happened. Right. So... Good, um, so it was in D.C., it wasn't in France. No, it was not in France. Good, thank you for correcting me. My pleasure. So, uh, something you had also to look, are there anyone, are there any signs of people knowing about an operation beforehand? Because nowadays, it's it's almost standard that there's like a film trailer, upcoming event, you know, right there in our face, in, in films, in the music scene, on news, or Twitter accounts, or something like that, sent out there, just, and I've been told by people on the inside that the, the people behind the so-called New World Order, their interpretation of karma is that if you inform your, your victim, about what's going to happen, and right. they do not react, then the karma is on them. It will take the karma away from the assassin, right. the attacker, and so on. And I spoke to Chip Tatum, the CIA whistleblower, and who was a he was George Bush Senior's uh, the commander of his private hit team. They carried out at least seventeen operations. I mean, this is the real deal. I asked him about this thing. Uh, about karma. He said he never heard of it before, but he said that every single time they got an assignment, he, they had to confront the person with an option to conform, as he said. He, he, he right. said. If they did not conform, then kill them. And, and Chip said, I was a soldier. It, it, he was saying, like, if they want him dead, just let me know, I'll kill him. But to confront him verbally, that is so much worse, he said, because if you never know how they will react. You can get really dangerous, right. really, for your team as well as yourself. And so, but he said, when, when I hear this, it makes total sense. So here, uh, you had before 9 11, all of these things, the London bombings, there were big programs in TV, the Panorama, one hour show where they went through the whole thing in great detail. 
And the very end, when you listen to that, that heaven happened before 770 in 2005, the very last thing that the host of the program says, just know you've been born. Yeah. I mean, really, how cold and sinister is that? Something very similar to that. I'm not exactly sure about the world, but I'm going to check it out. But very similar to it. Okay, so were there any signs of people knowing it? Well, there was a Twitter account, and Twitter, Facebook nowadays are standard in these operations. A Twitter account is always in English, so that it works globally. Sure. And the Facebook account of the assassin, the crazy lone guy, whatever, has a tendency to be updated after uh, the person is dead or in prison, put in jail. Then suddenly, the manifesto appears on his Facebook right. page or something like that. It's right in front of your eyes. How is that possible? But they know the power of social media. Names. So we check out Twitter, and there is one account that just boomed out to me because I recognized it from before. It's called MC Books, and it tweeted two days before this thing actually happened. This is the same day as the uh, drill was in Copenhagen. And the Twitter was, the tweet was, breaking death toll from Paris terror attack rises to at least 120 with 270 others injured. Now this, I know this account because I've seen it before. Because when the Peshawar school massacre, when uh, that was on the 21st, I think, of December 2014, where, by the way, one of the victims was Noah Posner, who is one, one of the victims from right. Sandy Hook two years right. earlier. Right. And welcome to this bizarre world. Uh, then this the Twitter account went up. Death toll from, from Pizarro School uh, massacre rises to at least 120 with 270 others injured. And when the Ebola outbreak was there, this Twitter account went out. Death toll in Ebola outbreak rises to at least 120 with 270 others injured. But all of these are false flag psyops. Yeah. The Ebola, the shower, and this one. What I'm saying is, if you look at this from a standpoint of that they might be connected, I would only suggest they're extremely connected, then see the oddity of what's going on. And, and Chip Tatum also said, and when I spoke to him once, he said, listen folks, you have no idea how small the community of assassins is globally. It is such a small group carrying out all of these things. Just traveling from country to country to country. Because it takes a lot to, to get people so skilled at this and also so reliable. Also, he said, not only the people carrying out the assassin, but the planning, the yeah. finance, and so on. It kept to a very small group. Okay, we also have a YouTube account that was called Videos Paris Attack Exclusively. That was created the day before Friday the 13th. I mean, how can somebody name a, a video a YouTube account called Videos Paris Attack Exclusively before it happens? So when people started pointing at it, myself included, suddenly this was deleted. Then we have dear old Wikipedia. I mean, you can trust Wikipedia, I'm sure telling you. Can. And here, less than two hours after the first bomb detonated, or so-called bomb, uh, there was a complete web page with all the details, with all the places of the attacks, the number of dead, the number of injured, and all of these things. And uh, if you know how to, you can backtrack the updates of websites with the IP number and so on. And when we did this with this page, because it, it kept getting uh, yeah. updated, and there was one update at uh, 11.06 p.m. in the evening, where it was, it was giving the whole detailed story about this, including what the French president said in his speech, you know, about um, uh, how the borders need to be closed, how, uh, you know, uh, in a state of emergency, and, and so on. The only problem is that the president didn't give the speech until 52 minutes later. Jeez. Go. Yeah, you can't you can't even call that a coincidence. 
You can't even call it a coincidence. No, of course not. This, if you see the JFK movie, there's a man there called Mr. X. His real name was Fletcher, Fletcher Carlton, a man that I really admired. He used to work for the Pentagon CIA, very deeply involved in false fact up until the JFK assassination when he became a whistleblower. He was on New Zealand because they wanted him out of the way because he was too honest. Uh -huh. So he was sent to the South Pole with some people. And then when he was in, on, in New Zealand, he picked up a newspaper, the Christ Church uh, News, and in that, he read the whole bio of Lee Harvey Oswald, and the whole what happened in Dallas, all of this, and this was before Oswald was even arrested in Dallas. And he said, because of the time difference and so on, this didn't really fit in, he said, at that very moment, I knew this was one of our operations. This was a false fact. I'm saying you, telling you, this is exactly what we're seeing here. This is before it even happens. And the problem here is that we have several different countries, time zones and so on involved, and it gets messed up. Right. People are under pressure, stress, very, very hard to keep things in the right order. I mean, when things happen naturally, it's just in a natural order. You don't right. have to make anything up. It will fit in perfectly. When you do things like this, not easy. And if I can remind people of the BBC reporter, the female reporter who's standing with the building seven behind her, I think it was 20 minutes before it went down, she said, and not only just, we had reports that uh, building seven, seven has, been, has uh, gone down as well. It's right behind Thank the you. tunnel. Right. It is right there behind you. Time differences, problem. Because this was also live TV where everything was going on at the same time. Nobody knows it's there, it's only afterwards. Okay, so we had this uh, meeting with all these different uh, security agencies, intelligence agencies, I would call them madness in the right. scenes instead. And Chip Tatum, he said, it's standard. These, they work together all the time. People say, no, it's the Mossad or the CIA or the MIS. He said they work together all the time, depending on who's needed, where, what country. So he said, I work with the Mossad, MI6, and whoever, and the, the Turkish, the Danish, the, you know, depending on what they needed to do, where it was to be carried out and so on. So they were standard. So nothing new under the thumb. So then we have uh, one of the standard things in a force fire operation is a drill. A drill, the drill, the drill. Uh, this is one of the sure signs that there is a force fight going on because that drill, it's always a security drill for your protection. I would suggest the drill is there so that they can put these things together without us interfering. Because they need to be able to close off streets, maybe evacuate buildings, uh, get uh, all kinds of vehicles in position, explosives in position. They need uh, crisis actors. They need maybe to lure the Patsy in position so that he can be blamed or they can be blamed and then killed. Uh, but they also need, you know, these are time consuming operations. So they need the logistics, they need bathrooms, they need yeah. coffee, cake, and um, makeup facilities. And uh, access to electricity so that they can blow things up, smoke bombs, these things. So, that is one thing I always check out when there's a hit somewhere, check out where in the near neighborhood is there a possibility of, for instance, parking uh, trucks, uh, military, whatever, but, but with no, so you can't look into the area. And I checked out here, yeah, it's filled with these places right where these things happen. And so the drill, the drill, was there a drill? Because there was a drill at the 7-7 bombings, exactly with the exact same theme that actually happened in London, 9-11, several different drills there. Boston bombings, five minutes before, boom. Drill. Uh, I mean, I can go on and on there. Drills are standard. Yeah. So we look here, Paris, was there a drill? And yes, surprise, surprise, there was actually a drill going on in Paris. It was a multi-site exercise, 
that was planned with the exact same scenario at what happened. And there was this man, his name is uh, Patrick Pilou, and he's a specialist of emergency medical services. And he said on radio that it was amazing because as luck would have it, in the morning we had exactly this operation going on with the ambulance services, the fire brigade, the police and so on. So it was so fantastic because since we were already on location, that actually saved lives. The exact same scenario. What are the chances? Okay, so uh, since I always look at the people central in these things, because they use the same people again and again and again and again. So I checked this guy out, Patrick Pilou, and it turned out that he was actually one of the witnesses in 2011, just outside the Charlie Hebdo office when that was under attack and turned on fire. And then in 2015, January of this year, he was in a meeting with first responders when he was called by the people at the Charlie Hebdo office because he, he worked for them as well. So he was like writing articles, both at the doctor and apparently also doing things for, for them. So while the shootings were going on there, somebody in the, uh, at the Charlie Hector office called him and said, please, we're being killed here, come, come, come. So he ran there because he was just nearby and he ran there, he was one of the first people on site. He went in there and he saved, uh, you know, gave him first uh, medical attention and so right. on. Uh, and then he picked up his cell phone and called the president, Francois Hollande, to tell him what has happened. Uh, Paul, did you notice something there? Do you have Obama's number in your cell phone? No, I don't. No, I uh, don't. I... But he, had, he had Francois Hollande, the exact same person that is now very central in this whole thing. So he called the president and said, Mr. President, this has happened. Anyway, so after that, uh, Patrick Pilgo uh, appeared several times on uh, TV and so on, crying, telling about the horror story of what happened at Charlie Hebdo, all of these people killed. By the way, that was a massive false man. I'm telling you, massive, massive. And uh, he was crying, and very emotional and so on. So, and it's the same here. Now he's very central in this thing. He's been interviewing, he's working as a reporter on site, doing all of these okay. things. So I checked him out because crying is not so easy if you are not emotionally right. true. And it turns out that he was actually playing the nurse in the 2009 film Incognito, and he was also playing the doctor in a film called Bad Girl from 2012. So he has a guy with multiple talents. He's a professional deceiver. He's an actor. He's a professional deceiver. That's how he makes his living. I'm just, I'm just showing things. It's up to people to make their own opinion yeah. or, or conclusion. But there was a, a drill going on, and there were loads of ambulances, especially ambulances, in central Paris before it happened. And uh, there was a woman who said that she lives on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, which is very close to this whole thing, also close to Charlie Hebdo. And she said that this day, her son came home from school with a letter advising parents on what to do in case of an emergency. And she said that was so odd, it was completely out of the blue. Yeah. Because, I mean, what emergency? And then boom, this happened. And the advice for the parents was not to call the police, not to come to the school, stay away from the area, and just listen for updates from a special radio called France Blue. So, like this. Microphone is dying on me, but it's not. Oh. Anyway, so uh, let's let's have a look at the um, the shooters because I mean these are it's said that there was at least eight that ran around with automatic weapons, killing people, blowing themselves up. It said that just in the beginning it keeps changing, so I I don't know what to say for sure. But in the beginning, I think there were four of them said to have blown themselves up including a woman, by the way, who also was a suicide bomber, uh, in the aftermath of this. She blew herself up. Ah, very sorry, she's still alive. I had an interview with her from Morocco, where she's totally confused, saying, I have no idea 
how they got my photos or I, these photos with, that was taken by a photographer and reporter and sold to global media. She said, I have nothing to do with it. She's still alive in Morocco. You can find it on YouTube. Anyway, so we look at uh, the people attacking uh, on the shooter, on I mean the shooters. And here it is said that they came from Syria, that they were Arabs and, and so on. So you would think maybe short, dark, dark skinned, Arab looking, and so on. Sorry. And what people have seen are well built, muscular, especially one was very muscular, clean shaven, white, dark hair, neatly trimmed. Uh, dressed in dark clothes, almost military looking, uh, with uh, dark pants and sweaters without colors. And that they came out, they came in a uh, Mercedes, a BMW, and I'm not sure about the third brand of car, because unfortunately, there's no CCTV footage at all of these people. It's only central Paris, after the Charlie Hebdo attack where they spend millions investing in all these high-tech things, controlled by Israeli companies, by the way, just as in London. But unfortunately, this day, they did not work for the bummer, the, the bad guy. Anyway, so also the way they, they were shooting, uh, people describe it as you know, very disciplined, cold, no emotion, and short burst of fire, like three shots at a time. Brr, brr. Like professionals do, not on our Akbar screaming, you know, at the mid in the middle of committing suicide, just totally just firing everywhere in fran frantically. You know, absolutely not cold and concise. So then it is said that uh, uh, well, let's go to if I can go to the Bataclan, which is the main event of the music theater. Good idea. You, uh, this music theater has a very colorful background. It's a very uh, known uh, building in Paris. It's bright yellow and red. Some people have pointed out that it's uh, the facade is quite uh, Freemasonic. That there are ten uh, pillars and also some kind of like an all-seeing eye. Also, when you go down the alley, that has uh, later, it's become quite famous, that alley on the side with the exits from the club, there is uh, an entrance there, number 13, very symbolic for, for the Freemasons, and so on. They're very much into numerology, dates, and, and so on. And that number 13, on the, the, the doors there, there are some Masonic symbols spray painted. Coincidence or not? I don't know. I'm just pointing it out. Anyway, this, uh, this uh, music theater had been owned for some 40 years by a Jewish family. And just two months before, it was sold. Uh, it was sold by the Jewish brothers, Joel and Pascal Lalou. Uh, and the, the buyer is an investment firm called Le Gardere, whose largest part, uh, partner is Qatar Holding. Uh, and this, according to some sources I have, this uh, holding company have been known to finance other so-called terror uh, operations. I was I was on a show the other day with the former U.S. Special Army Special Operations Officers from the 11th Psychological Operation Battalion, a global psychological warfare counterterrorism analyst. His name is Scott Bennett, and that was a mouthful for you. And. His task before he became a whistleblower and was put in jail for two years was to track down financing of terrorism in, on, in the Western Hemisphere, it specialized in the Arab world to track down the funding from there. I asked him specifically about this company in Qatar Holding, and he said he was, uh, well, he said more or less that I was spot on. He said he could not go into details, but he said you're right on track. So that was interesting. That is interesting. Also, there, uh, there are at least two of the bars where the shooting uh, owned that changed owners, as according to the sources that I have been telling me, where there are Jewish owners and uh, where they were changed just before, a few months before, meaning that possibly the ones behind this attack would then be able to control all parameters of that building 
in the build up, you know, whatever footage we see, we see whatever whatever that was going on inside that could have been done beforehand. Prepared, pre recorded photos beforehand and so on and so on. So um, we see that it is said that there was a, a, a concert, there was an American band there called Eagles of Death Metal, where the lead singer, his nickname is The Devil, and I think the, the um, because there's a lot of these satanic uh, things going on, like a psyop, so I'm just pointing these things out. And also, I think the song they played was Anthem to the Devil, Johnny's song. I think it was Kiss the Devil. Kiss the devil. I think that's what it, I could be wrong because I haven't got oh, into it as no, deeply as you. I, I stand corrected. If so, if so, it was something uh, endearing to the devil. Yeah, it's, right. Something so endearing. So uh, it is said they were playing this uh, song, and in came four gunmen with uh, with uh, automatic weapons. Witnesses keep saying Kalashnikov. I mean, all the witnesses that have said in, said in interviews, everyone is mentioning Kalashnikov. I don't know if so many people are very good at the weapons, but that is the AK-47 AK Kalashnikov is the uh, weapon preferred by Muslim terrorists. At least that is the picture we've been given, because it's one of the best weapons ever made for these type of operations. But here, um, when you talk to people in the psyops, they say you keep repeating the same keywords to hammer the message in, into right. people's subconscious. It's terrorism, it's attack, it's bomb, it's fear, it's terrorist, it's Abdullah, it's Kalashnikov, AK-42, you know, all of these things make right. an impact into your subconscious where you just go into fear mode. So, is it by chance that everybody keeps mentioning Kalashnikovs or by the side? Anyway, it said that these four shooters, uh, they kept reloading and was just firing right into the crowd of between, it was sold out, so it was between 1,000 and 1,500 people. Witnesses said that the shooting went on for 10 to 15 minutes. I would like to count how many shots were fired by 10 shooters with automatic weapons for 15 minutes. I would say we're easily up in the thousands and thousands. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. But here we only had 80 victims, so apparently they were extremely bad shots. Shots. Anyway, so uh, then it said that uh, the police uh, got close and, and uh, after a while entered the building. Uh, they pushed uh, the people back, uh, the shoes back into the building. Some uh, people were taken as hostage. There was some negotiation going on. And then one, two, or three of these suicide bombers decided to blow themselves up. And one, the last one, was killed or taken, depending on what version you, you want to believe. So, one, two, or three people with bombs, very horrific sight. I mean, horrendous. They would be like, oh, yeah. Right. Just doing everything would just be horrific. Here we have absolutely no footage whatsoever, except a few. There's one, uh, for instance, I mean, we're talking like, a thousand, let's say a thousand people in the audience. Would there be no footage, no video films of the event itself, the, the band playing? Yes, there is one. And it's, uh, you can see the band playing, and you can see the, the, the guitarist uh, and the drummer. The drummer uh, assumed they're playing the song, and suddenly from behind the uh, guy filming, you can hear the, the shots being fired. So I don't know about you, Paul. If somebody fired an AK-47 behind my right ear, I would jump. I would, you know, like just out of fear, get scared. To, 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 and here, the, the camera is steady like a rock, totally steady, not moving, even though the shots have been fired. Also, the people in front of the camera, the black silhouettes of people, they're not moving at all. So I would not trust this footage at all, either. Now, let me ask a question, and this might be a stupid question from an old guy who hasn't been in a discotheque in a long time. When I would go to a discotheque, 
It seems to me that they would check me for Kolesnikovs on the way in. How could you get, how can you get those inside? I mean, wouldn't it, could they do it under their clothing or? Well, you're asking two good questions. I'm sorry. They're too, they're too good to be answered. Also said that uh, uh, it's also said that they uh, these suicide bombers they use the same explosives as were used by the suicide bombers in London, and it goes under the name of TAPD. I think it's TAPD or TADP, something like that. When you look at the ingredients in that, it is absolutely ridiculous. I think it's black pepper or chili pepper with some hair bleach and some super outside thing mixed in a bathtub. There, it, you can make a sort of explosives out of it, but it's totally unreliable. It's, uh, as far as I know, depending on the temperature, it can go off at any time. It's not reliable at all. And when it came to the 7-7 bombings, where they said to them that was what they used to blow up uh, to, you know, all of these different subway stations because there were a lot more explosions than most people know about, including that bus uh, that where they blew the whole roof up. Uh, when you, the people looking at the crime scene, unfortunately, all the subway and the wagons that were blown up were never allowed, anyone was allowed to see them at all. And after one year, they were destroyed. No photos, no nothing. But there were some crime scene evidence, and the thing that were found were traces of uh, high-grade uh, military, high-grade C4 explosives, which is super duper military uh, explosive, and detonators that were so advanced that the specialists didn't even know what they were looking at. Plus, that when you hear witnesses from from uh, this horrific event. Many of them were talking about, they didn't talk about the explosion, they talked about being electrocuted, that the whole subway station were, were like lifted up and shaken and they saw like flames on the outside, white, yellow, uh, orange, and a lot of um, sparks, but they said it was like we were being electrocuted. That word electrocuted was being used so, by so many of these witnesses, were not explosives. Amazing. But here... It is said that they use the same explosives, it sounds very professional, TAPD. I mean, how many people know what that is? But if you're a terrorist, you use the good stuff. That's right. <laughs> I saw an interview on, I think it was NBC, um, where I just want to point out also NBC, Fox News, CNN. These five companies were so central in 9 11. All the witnesses, everybody that they phoned during and had the calling into the program while it was live, all of these people had some kind of connection to these fire yes. networks. And they're very central in many of these false facts spreading out this kind of crap. So, um, anyway, we had very odd, I must say, there was uh, one person on Danish TV who was at the concert. He said that the concert started one up half an hour before scheduled. 30 minutes before it was supposed to go on, it, it went on. Very odd. And then that news clip disappeared from the industry TV. Anyway, so and one of the things is uh, also, I said, you know, NBC, sorry, I got a little confused here. NBC, they interviewed the SWAT team leader, the French SWAT team leader, and he gave this incredible story. He was standing there with this black mask on and all this thing, sh showing a shield with bullet uh, holes in and, and so on. And he said that they came into this uh, cafe, uh, no, this music theater, and it was eerie, it was totally quiet, and there were seven to 8,000 people on the floor. Seven to 8,000? 8, 8, and then the, the host said, uh, 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 do you mean seven to 800? And he said, yes, and just continued. And they said that everybody was quiet, there was blood everywhere, nobody said a sound, nobody was doing anything. And then they continued in and then had the shootout with some of them and so on. I just found it very odd that seven to eight hundred people, when they were being rescued, were just lied there, not said a word. And also that no one has taken any photos from the inside, any video footage, anything, while this whole thing is going on for like they were there for a long time. Zero, zero, and zero. 
So uh, then one of them, at least one of them, blew himself up. Blew himself up. But thank God we found a thumb or a finger, so he could be fingerprinted and identified. So a right. finger. Uh, survived the whole explosion, that was good. And also, they found a passport. Now, have we heard that before? Right. The answer is yes. We had 9-11. There was the, just the two, one or two of the biggest towers in the world. I think more than 500 million tons. I, I mean, there's so much concrete, steel, all this, everything came down, free fall speed, turned into dust, no furniture, no nothing, hardly anybody's survived, everything turned into dust except for a passport. Because when you are a suicide bomber, you have to remember your passport. I think right. maybe it's when you knock on the pearly gate, right. you know, that to, to identify yourself. Uh, I don't know, but you need your passport. Uh, and by the way, also the guy, when they came, when the rental car they came, uh, to the airport with before 9-11. Uh, they also had a VHS cassette on how to fly a 757. That's very handy if you want to do maneuvers that right. no one else in the world can do. And also a Quran, of course, was there in the car. Quran, yeah. So that was very handy. And then uh, we had the 7-7 bombings in London where four suicide bombers there, Arabs, you know, of course, and uh, Muslims, of course. And by the way, they managed to find the same passport in three different subway stations. I repeat, the same passport was found in three different locations. And then they even found his driver's license. Only one minor problem, he did not have one. But it was put forward as evidence, even though he did not have a driver's license. Then we had Charlie Hebdo, where the video with two terrorists jumping out of this black Citroen, killing this uh, police officer on the pavement. By the way, he's doing fine. He lives in Brazil now. He's a Mossad agent. Uh, but uh, the car that they were driving in was a Citroen C3 from 2014 with chrome side mirrors and extra light in the front. The car was abandoned. By the way, almost in the back of the rear window was crushed or shut out, they say. The car that was abandoned and where they did the forensic evidence, uh, re, um, the forensic investigation of, was a Citroen C3 from 2013, black side mirrors and no extra light in the front. Not the same vehicle. But in that vehicle, they found the ID of one of the, of one of the terrorists. Very, very handy. And here we have again the passport comes. So this passport uh, that managed, of course, here we have suicide bombers again. What should I bring? Explosives. I have to, my suicide bombs, my Kalashnikov. Uh, I need to get hold of a brand new uh, BMW or Mercedes, Balaclava, black clothes, uh, all of it. And my passport. Right. Must not forget my passport. Right. It's on the checklist for terrorists, professional terrorists. Amateurs might forget it, not the real ones. So here the passport very conveniently pointed toward Syria and that it had come, to, it was a Syrian passport and that it was stamped at uh, Leros, the Greek island on the 3rd of October, saying that they came with this uh, whole flood of refugees coming into Europe at the time. Right. I, I would just mention that I, for one, as a researcher, have known about this invasion being on standby for five, six years now. I think David and I have been talking about it for a lot longer, but I've known about their agenda. It's in their books, David Rockefeller, Snowdensky, these kind of people, check out their books. That is one of the things that they're using to create this chaos, because now is the, the, the crescendo of all, like a Wagner ending of an opera. Right. Uh, here's where they want push everything together so it will be total chaos, total fear, total terrorism, explosions everywhere, da, 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 and in come they as the hero with global martial law. Oh, that's the idea. Also that we should fear our friends and, and neighboring countries and 
and Muslim sisters and brothers, and them being the being the enemy. It's the old divide and conquer, the right. old Roman temple here again. Divide and conquer, diversion, problem reaction solution. These are the ones that we have to look out for and false flags. So we look at the name of the guy in the passport. Now his name is Salah Abdel Salam. And if you if you can remember, I've many times said that they, they always want three names. You know, Li Ha Li Aswa. Right. James O. Ray. Da da da. Even for serial killers when they're used in different operations and so on. And I've been told that it's to give it more credibility. It sounds more my God, we have really researched this, or right. this is really to, to get it more weight. And here we have Salah Abdel Salah. It's actually two names, but if you listen to it, I don't know if it's a, a real name, but if you can get, listen to it as part of a possible sire, Salah Abdel Salah, your subconscious might hear Allah Abdel Islam. Mm -hmm. So exactly the ones, the, the ones, the wordings that you want to trigger people into the Muslim fear uh, right. of Islam. And then Salah Abdel Salam, his photo went out on the internet and through the French uh, security forces, they prompted out there saying, this is the guy who we are looking for. I mean, first he blew himself up, then he's wanted. And I've got one, I, I found him. On one of the photos, it's uh, one of these photos from the, in the night when this is taken. There's some um, people running around with a stretcher, one victim on it, bearing the victim very relaxed with his hand behind his head, right. wanting to have a good time. And on the pavement there, there are only two bystanders. One of them is Salah Abdel Salam, and the other one, I, I'm telling you, is Omar Ismail, Ismail Mustafa, who is his. Uh, Accomplishing this, they're just standing there, right there in your face. Then you have Sky News made a, a news report the days after. I think it was a day or two days after this thing happened. And they're in Paris, they're filming different streets and so on, and they're reporting from the city, you know, of terror, how people are reacting. And then there's a voiceover while the footage is ongoing. And the guy says something to the meaning of who knows how many that are still out there hiding. Something similar like that. How can we know how many are still out there hiding? And right when they say that, it's there's uh, uh, the, the film is of a cafe called Attitude. And then it's a, a, a zebra crossing, a pedestrian crossing. You see people walk away from the camera. Then in from the right, I mean, this guy is walking in the middle of the street. He comes in from the right, passes right across in front of the camera, looks into the camera, and even smirks. That is Salah Abdel Salam. Wow. I mean, welcome to the bizarre world of psyops on a scale. I mean, this thing is more bizarre than I have ever seen anything before. Because also, many of the when you look at the footage of victims of SWAT teams or so on, you cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. But I found photos, you can see on my Facebook page, I put a lot of these out there. My Facebook is Ole Damagard. And for instance, in one of these SWAT teams, you can see there's this big, well built soldier, all black and so on. And he's holding a BB gun. All of the other people are like machine guns, and he's standing with a BB gun, pointing in a way that a military guy would get his head knocked off, off by his officer if he was pointing like that. We got another one, one of my favorites. You see, there are two SWAT team members with pistols off like this. They're walking right behind him, behind each other, and the officer is holding his hand on, on the shoulder of the guy in front of him, both with pistols off like that. He's aiming it more or less to the head of his partner in, in front of him, at least like two to three decimeters away from his head. Okay, so you look, that's okay, possible. Then you look at his holster. It is on his right hand side, but he's holding the pistol with his left hand. What is that? Ew, how's that? Then, then you have many of these photos are cut, are cut and paste, very crude, 
on, on backgrounds. Many of them are composites of not real photos. And it's, they're real photos, but they're cut and pasted in on top of each other. Even photos of Francois Hollande, when he's just walking down on a stair or in front of a, a, a white wall, no need for any you know, manipulation right. whatsoever. But it's right there. If you know your Photoshop, you can see, shit, this is cut out. And it's done in a way so that I would say maybe this is back to this karma thing. And they want as many, they want to show as many of us this thing since they are aiming globally. And if we do not react, then globally the karma will be on our shoulders. Right. Because some of them is pathetic. It's cut out, you know, white edges and, and the proportions are not correct. And, and then we have a photo from inside the Bataclan music theater. And by the way, Bataclan comes from an operetta by Jacques Offenbach uh, in 1855 or something like that. And the theme of that operetta called Bataclan is the conspiracy to overthrow the emperor. Oh, man. So, so is that part of the psyop? I don't know. But I can say that uh, the, the name of the cafe in Copenhagen where the shooting was, that was the gunpowder keg. And it was on uh, the date and connected to the, what's his name? The guy who wanted to blow up the parliament in London. Uh, I can't remember. Well, no, neither can I. But also you have the, very often like there was a, a so-called terror event in Sweden, a very recent game where somebody, in Sweden we don't have mass shootings here, they stab people instead. It said, he, he dressed up like Darth Vader, came in a mask, yeah. and uh, it was on Halloween. Hello. And he stabbed, a, it said that he stabbed a, a, a teacher and two other pupils. And uh, the name of that school is called the Crown, which is the symbol for uh, the royal family, you know, or the Swedish state. So I'm just pointing these out things about, is it coincidence, is it not? Is it part of a psyop, is it not? So, uh, where were we? Yes, there are two photos from inside the Bataclan that is said to have been taken two, three minutes before the shooting. The crowd is going wild, like, yay, hey, like yeah. this. And to start with, I was just like, okay, no problem. And then I started looking, there's something wrong here. And I started seeing, this is a composite, just like, you know, the cover of the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club right. Band. There's a hundred different faces, you know, some of them are, are cloned as in more than one place, and loads and loads of arms doing this satanic uh, devil yeah. down sign. You know, some of the arms are like six feet long, and some of the heads, and some are very sharp, the contrast is very hard. If you don't really look, if you just uh, sort of go through it and say, oh, it's so awful, it's so awful, you won't notice, but if you start looking, it's super obvious. And there are two photos, two different angles, and they're done it on both of these very poorly. I tell you, if I had been given that task, you know, as a paid job, I would, I would have been fired. It's that badly done. So the question is, why, if not this karma thing? And when you see, uh, if you right click on these images, there's a description of the name, you know, the name of the image, and it says uh, 500 pounds or euros charged for any use of this uh, from the Eagles death, uh, Eagles of Death Metal thing. If you use it, you will be charged 500 pounds. I've never, ever seen that before, ever. That's part of the crackdown on the internet, I think. That's supposed to be one of the most fa uh, famous, if not the most popular group now, is this... Uh, Eagles of Death. <clears throat> so they're well, making money on they, that too. Totally, totally. I mean, this is the thing when you sell out. I mean, overnight they became a, a, a world-renowned band. Nobody had heard about them before, I think. Then you have the number of deaths and the, the, that keeps changing. Keeps changing. It was uh, all the way up 153. 
then it went down to 127, then it's 120, then I don't know what it is now, but how can you miscount more dead people right. along? You know, like one, two, three, four, one 152, right. and then, no, sorry, it's like 20 odd people wrong. Yeah. How can you do that? But this is how they do it as well. It's like uh, looking at a watercolor painting on water, you know, it keeps changing, so you can't grip it really. Yeah. You know, it's and I think that's done by design also to confuse, to confuse people. So, also, there is one single photo from the crime scene. When you look at all the footage of people shot in the streets, there's a lot of people, they're covered in blankets and so on. Not a single drop of blood at all, I would say. Not one. There's a, a tiny little drip of blood here, a tiny little man. But we're talking about people being killed with AK-47. Yeah. And Scott Bennett and his colleagues say, if you're hit by an AK-47, there's a hole the size of a tennis ball. This is a oh. powerful weapon. Yeah. And here, no blood whatsoever. But, and, and I think, you know, that the, since uh, uh, the Boston bombing, which was a total false flag as well, by the way, I'm involved in a series of books together with Jim Fetz and many, many other uh, world-renowned researchers. The first book is called, and I suppose we didn't go to the moment either. The second one is called, uh, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook. And the third one that we're working on now is called, And Nobody Died in Boston either. And a week ago, Amazon banned the Sandy Hook book. It is banned. It is just, I tell you, this is history. Because is. I don't know if this happened since uh, the Watergate, uh, you know, the Pentagon Papers or whatever that was. When that was uh, blocked, you know. Here, it is being censored. So now we're printing, for one thing, you can go to my website, Light on Conspiracies, or Reds.com, or other major uh, websites. Uh, on my website, you go to my books, go down, there's one link there where it says, uh, Nobody Died in Sandy Hook for free. Please download the PDF. You can get the whole book there for free. And also, I've redesigned the cover now. It's going to be printed by a new publisher where it's set like a metal up in the corner and banned by Amazon. So this is a way of turning it around. They try to stop us, we turn it around. Right. It's I saw this sign, uh, the more you screw with us, the more, the more we multiply. That's right, <laughs> that's right. I think it's important that everybody get those. Those books are going to be um, landmark books. They're going to be really important. They're going to be the things that blow this wide open. Everybody should get one. If you want a Christmas gift, buy this for your uh, non-believing uh, neighbor or your non-believing relative. It's well documented. These people are impeccable researchers. It's a fantastic book and I think it's really pivotal. That's why they have to ban it. This thing is really powerful. So I'm really glad you did it and I'm glad that you've told everybody how they can get it. Go to Oli's website, Light on Conspiracies. Is that it? Dot, 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 com. dot com. And uh, get that book. It's really important. If you want to turn this around, that's the first thing you can do. Get that book and we can move forward. Go ahead. It's, it's also, I've got other books of my own. One of them is called Coup d'etat in slow motion. That is also, I would call, a, a similar book when it comes to turning this whole thing around. I've been trying to get it published for 25 years, could not. I even received threats and all of these things. But in the end, I published it myself. And now it's published with Jim Fitz's uh, uh, Moon Rock books. As well. So that book as well, you know, if you want a Christmas gift or something like that, it's almost a thousand pages, just as detailed as what I'm doing now. Very well, I mean, it's my, a third of my life put into that thing. So, Please, if nothing else, support the efforts for all of our future. Right. Very important. Very important. Thanks, Oli. So we look at more of these photos because they are bizarre, I tell you. There's uh, the only one where there's one of a body in the street, and it looks almost like uh, the monument over an unknown, the unknown 
one soldier, you know, one big tabarat, you got the body lying very like this, covered with a blanket, and the lighting from from above is incredible. I mean, the whole blanket is like fluorescent. It, it, it almost looks divine. No blood on the street, no nothing. Uh, and the only blood that I've seen otherwise uh, is one guy that comes in a t-shirt. He's being led away uh, by a SWAT team member. By the way, these SWAT team members always have masks, so you can't identify them. Right. And uh, uh, But look at the t-shirt. The blood is diagonally like sprayed on him, like somebody has taken a bottle and just swoop like this. Yeah. Because the, if it was real blood from him, the, the damages to his body would be very odd to say the least. Right. Or did, would it fit that he had been carrying one uh, that had been bleeding? No, it does not fit at all. So also there's one minor little problem here. The tissue is back to front and inside out. You know, are we in a you know, stressful situation? Is it uh, also uh, after I looked very deeply into the uh, mass shooting uh, in Oslo, no, the mass shooting in Norway, and the blowing up of the government building in 2011, one of the things I found was that on one side of the government building, where I believe there were real victims, uh, the URL to the image itself, you know, that when you click on an image in the, in, the, in the browser window, you will see the name of the website, the yeah. forward slash, blah, 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 forward slash, and then the name of the image. Well, in Norway, where there were real victims, uh, the URL was uh, uh, tv2.no, that's one of the national TV stations, tv2.no forward slash uh, images forward slash victims forward slash, and then the name of the image. But on the other side of the building, where there were crisis actors, you know, filled with blood and so on, that right. became like the poster girls for terror globally when right. it came to Norway. And there, the search way to these images said tv2.no forward slash images forward slash actors in Norwegian forward slash and the name of the image. So these things are not supposed to be seen. It's only because I'm such a false flag geek that I notice these things. And here we look at, the, especially the photos connected to CNN. They say, uh, I think it's something like uh, idn.turner.com forward slash CNN next forward slash MAP forward slash assets forward slash and the name of the image. And acid, if you talk, talk to Jill Tatum and so on, that's the CIA's people, whatever the operation they're using, there are many different types of assets, but that is what the name is. And here you have it right in your face, but you don't see it. Okay, so also uh, we were talking about uh, this, build, this photo inside the building. There's one footage made of corpses inside the, the Bataclan music theater. And it is said that there's at least 80 dead. This photo is, uh, it's a photo, you can find it on the, on, uh, the internet, it's, what, it's a bizarre photo. There's 25 dead bodies spread around on the floor. By the way, uh, normally the floor of Black Bataclan is a beautiful wooden floor. Here it looks like concrete or that they wrote something out. And then these dead bodies are there. There's 25 of them, not 80. There's no signs of anyone blowing themselves up. And it looks like some giant have used a giant brush and painted in blood like a, like a symbol around them. This is all, it's like a, a three feet wide. This very evenly spread out pattern around these bodies. And people say that the evidence, they, they were dragging the bodies over the floor, trying to save them. But why would you try and drag them around in like almost a circular motion? And also, that body would be like a 400 pound body with a very evenly uh, flood of blood coming out to be able to. It, it really looks, what do you call these machines, you know, before ice hockey games uh, or cleaning when you clean? Zamboni. Is that a Zamboni? Zamboni. Zamboni. 
it looks like somebody used the Samboni and just drove around and made this image. And uh, my interpretation of the, the, the shape of this, that some people have said it looks like the Egyptian eye, the island of Isis. I say it's a heart. And is that part of a silent in this very gruesome, satanic, awful thing that the, I, the whole thing with Paris being the, the city of romance, you know, Sean de right. Cine, that's going to Paris in spring. And so is that what it is? And by the way, Paris means uh, it comes from the city of Isis. Yeah. That's where the name comes from. But uh, nowadays, I, Isis is actually, the, the real interpretation of Isis is Israeli uh, Security Intelligence Services. That is what it stands for. You can find that on YouTube as well. There are people sure. from the 1990s that are speaking openly about this. I would say Isis is just an, an, an upgrade from from Al Qaeda, which is a totally uh, CIA creation, with the help of Mossad and other agencies, to create this out of boogie, this uh, tool of terror. And then when we weren't getting afraid, when we couldn't even scare school children with Al Qaeda anymore, Al Qaeda is the name of CIA's database, by the way, of right. these uh, people. Then. Out of the blue came Isis, sponsored by Toyota. Right. Because uh, also, once again, I dare you, if you can show me one image of ISIS where there's a vehicle and it's not a Toyota, um, it is there, Toyota, Toyota. Old Toyotas, bad new Toyotas, it's Toyotas every single time. Product placement. Oh, here we have product placement as well, I tell you. You've got, uh, there's outside the Bataclan, you've got footage of these SWAT team uh, people. And by the way, look at how they're holding their rifles, how they're shooting. It's like, you know, like teenage girls who've never held a weapon before. It's like, yeah. I've spoken to military people, they're like, what the hell is that? We're looking at actors, we're looking at cowboys and Indians on a film set, you know, running around, making it sound a lot and look a lot, it's not real. It is not for real, I would suggest. And uh, so I totally lost the thread. Well, wait, I'm about. sorry, I threw you off on uh, <laughs> product placement, but I know you've product talked about placement. that before. Okay. Well, outside the Bataclan, the day, the day after, uh, there, were, there were some blood. Uh, this was 24 hours later. The blood day, it was still wet. That's quite odd and quite thick. You know, I don't know how that works, but apparently maybe French blood is uh, different than other blood. And uh, uh, then you have photos of these uh, you know, police officers in black. And in between their legs, you got two shoes, very uh, positioned exactly so you can see them on de several different shots. Black shoes with a very white logo, Nike. Nike, Nike. Coincidence, then you have a guy who went you know, just outside the stadium and he was on his mobile phone when one of the suiciders blew him up, blew himself up. And a piece of shrapnel and was just going to hit him in the head, but thanks to his mobile, it saved his life. So he was interviewed, his name was Sylvester, he didn't give his full name, and he's holding up the phone that is smashed, you can see where the shrapnel hit it, and it says Samsung, the phone that saved my life. Can you hear the jingle in the background? <laughs> and then CNN went out and said, uh, oh my God, news, news, breaking news, that ISIS, we now know that they're using a new app called Telegram, and they even show the app the logo. It's super duper with the hyper, cyber duper, uh, encrypted, all of these things, you right. can make group calls, and there's a whole description of what it may, what it can do. And they say this is the tool of ISIS. How many people out there would think, well, if it's good enough for ISIS, ISIS. it's good enough for me. Right. I mean, this is not the only time they keep doing this. Yeah. You know when the, the bomb that blew up in, in uh, Tavistock Square in London at the 77 bombs, that's a yeah. quite a symbolic place as well to be blown up. And on one side, there was this uh, uh, like poster for an upcoming uh, terror film where the scenario I think was uh, 
in the subway service system of London, and it says something like it, the brilliant pure terror, something like that, absolutely brilliant pure terror. Right. And on the other side of the bus, uh, which was totally prepared so that when the whole thing blew up, they cut off the whole ceiling so that it just lifted up like this. There was a poster of a Coca Cola bottle with an explosion behind it. So the millions of people, when they're looking at this, what do they see? Oh, the terror, of your subconsciously, oh, man, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty at the same time. Jeez. Charlie Hecto, blood on the floor, all of this, the only photo that came out from the crime scene, as far as I've seen, all that blood, the other blood, and there's a chair put right on top of it, and right next to it, where your eyes are drawn to, there's a back where it says, boom. They're untapping you. They're, they're playing ping pong with our brains. They really are. But, but then, let's go back to the victims, because there's a whole lot of uh, people officially dead. Uh, and many, many countries involved as well among the victims, not just France. French. So how do you involve a country if you want to involve it emotionally? You kill one of their citizens. Right. Yeah. Who cares if there's four people from El Salvador who died? If you're not from El Salvador, who cares if two people from Sweden died? If you're not from Sweden, right. who cares five people from Sudan? If you're not from the UK, do you know like? But if you are from that country and one of your citizens were killed, all oh, the tragedy, That's right. the impact, my. God, it's so awful. So how do you involve as many as possible? You involve as many countries as possible, since you're aiming globally. So here we have a long line of uh, countries where there's one victim from each country. Then there was a, a Mexican girl, her name was Noemi Gonzalez. She and her boyfriend were at the concert, and uh, her parents heard of this on media in, in in Mexico, so they called because they were freaked out, and they couldn't get hold of her, but instead they got hold of her boyfriend, and he said, no, no, we're fine, we're fine, we're standing outside here, and then he, she was picked up by the police to be interrogated as a witness, and ended up dead, Whoa. and there was another guy who said that he was a, an eyewitness to what happened, and he was taken in by the police, and one of the first questions they asked was, where do you come from? So my question is, is it possible that they were looking for as many nationalities as possible to add to the list? You, you have to look at it like this because the, the mindset behold, behind this is so cold, so sinister. We're just talking collateral damage. From them, the more dead, the better. And the more so, countries involved. The more countries involved. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Then I'm getting tired. Or do you want me to? No, no. Out? This is great. <laughs> I was just wondering how scripted are these things. I mean, we obviously have a crew that comes in and does them. There's obviously somebody who designs it, and there's actors that come in and out, and there's product placement. Those fancy cars. They always drive fancy cars, and mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how much of this do you think is scripted, and how much is ad hoc afterwards. Like, it sounds like this Mexican woman, this was kind of an afterthought. Oh, we need somebody from Mexico, so let's just take her out. I think it's all of it is scripted. Yeah. All of it is scripted. You, if you hired me, with my knowledge, I mean, I'm not into these things at all, on the contrary, but with my knowledge, I could just set it up step by step. This, 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 this. And Chip said, they have staff meetings, you know. Okay, darling, bye bye. Thank you for the coffee. Nice breakfast. I'm going to to the office. Staff meetings. That time, very cold. What what is it we want? What what kind of effect is desired? What is it we're trying to accomplish? This this this. We want to be able to get the whole world to accept the total group from mass murder in Syria right. and, and other places. You know, for for them to accept martial law. How are we going to do it? Very cold is step one, step two, step three. And then he also said that they had 
meetings before, you know, planning with marketing agencies, so all of these things put together to get the whole thing uh, in place. Then it's carried out. Then they have meetings while it's going on or write us straight afterwards. And then if the effect has not been accomplished, then they do an additional thing just to add the thing up. And this is where, for instance, when they, they, they do you know, the beheading in Woolwich, which is my, one of my absolute favorites, where it's said that these two black guys chopped the head of an English soldier. I mean, it is one of my all-time favorites. It's so bad. It's so poorly carried out. So I, I love that one. But uh, they were trying to drag the attention away from the upcoming Bilderberg meeting that was just a week later in outside in Watford, outside London. That was the whole point with that one. But they didn't really get the, the effect uh, required, in my opinion. So boom, the very next day there was an almost similar thing in Paris. Do you know? Add to the whole thing. And here we have this whole thing happen. And then suddenly in Mali, you had the exact same thing. You know, you know it said that this hotel, uh, the I don't even want to say the hotel's name because I mean that is also product placement, I think. Yeah, I think so. That hotel then keeps being repeated, keeps being repeated. And then you have the same thing there. Lots, I think out of, was it 27 victims? I'm not really sure, but there was like 13 or 15 different countries. You know, that's pretty good, or pretty spread out. And many of them had some kind of connection into military intelligence in these countries. So are they even real victims or are they agents? Who? I mean, who knows who's working for the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, all of these uh, agencies? Who, who do you know? You know? The MI6, the MI4, where are they? Is it possible that these people are handpicked there as victims as well? You know, just like in Operation Northwood, where uh, where they were planning, uh, I think it was uh, General Lemnitzer, he was planning, he came up with a plan in the early 60s that fill a whole plane with CIA operatives, and get it up in the air, exchange it with a drone, get the agents down. Right. You know, the drone then goes uh, up in open water towards Cuba, then we blow it up remotely and blame it on Castro. But the people officially dead are our own agents who created identities and so on. And here we have, I don't even know if anyone died here. I have no idea. And it's, it's just bizarre to even say a thing like that. Oh, I, I tell you, maybe, because the, uh, the same evening after this happened, there was a big fire in Calais, which is, uh, I think, an hour's drive northwest uh, towards uh, England, England, to Channel, and where there's been a whole lot of, uh, you know, big story and scandals about refugees there. There was a massive big area that was turned on fire. It was, it was said that it was a refugee camp and they turned it on fire. I heard an interview with the vice mayor of that place. He said that nobody has been injured, nobody has been blah, blah, blah. Then our team came out with a story that there was a hundred dead there. And when you look at the footage, there's no ambulances, there's no, no people even standing there, you know, warming themselves near close to the flames and so on. The difference between zero dead and a hundred dead, pretty big. Then that story just disappeared. But my question is, is it possible that the crisis actors, the group of people in the center of this whole operation, they were put on buses, I saw that, the footage of them put on buses with these golden blankets, and then is it possible that these buses went there, these people were executed to shut everything down, the risk of whistleblowers and so on, and then burned? Could have happened. This, this is a this is a theory. I do I cannot base this on fact yet. It's a theory. Can I, can I go back to Bataclan? Oh yeah, please do. Okay, because there is uh, people say, but of course there are videos. I've seen videos uh, of the whole shooting. No, you did not. 
what you saw was a video of somebody living in the alley next to the Bataclan uh, music theater. And that guy who was filming, he was hanging out of his window, filming people down in the alley, running, coming out from the uh, music club, being shot. I mean, there's four or five people uh, falling dead in the, in the exit there, in the Lucy exit. There's one woman hanging from a window ledge, another guy standing in a window trying to hold on, and then some people are dragging away dead bodies and so on. So, very dramatic. Now, let's look at it. For one thing, if you go down Google Map and check out that alley, it is very easy to shut up in one of the, uh, one of the end. It's a long, 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 totally straight alley. So that, and it's, it ends up almost in a, where you can close uh, uh, gates in front of it. Very narrow, so very easy, easy to control, perfect for an operation like this. And if you look in the, where this footage is in, there's, it's empty, there's no one there, except for the people playing out the drama. Then you have who filmed it. Oh, it was real film, it was some, an amateur because the camera was shaking. Sure. Well, sorry, you can be part of a thing like this and shake on purpose to make it look authentic. Right. It is a possibility. Now, the guy that filmed it was a journalist from Le Monde, which is one of the major newspapers, if not the major newspaper in Paris and France, that was very central in spreading out a lot of the death information around Charlie Hebdo and around this as well. As. And so he, that's possible, he's a journalist, he lives there, not impossible. But it said afterwards that he was shot in the hand and he was among the wounded. I'm just asking, the four shooters were inside by the club. He was on the, living in a building on the other side of the alley next to the building, and he was shot in the hand. But that is also one way of, of getting away from avoiding criticism because when somebody like me point to some people say, well, how can you say that they, they're dead? Right. He was wounded. How can you even say a thing like this? This is part of the plan as well. Because how can I say, I don't know if anyone is dead? Because officially, 120 or 27 or 50, 153, you tell me, are supposed to be dead. How is that possible? And I just say that, the, you know, like the, I think it was the Goebbels, uh, Hitler's propaganda minister, the minister of propaganda, who said the bigger the lie, the easier it is for, for people to believe right. in it, right. to get people to believe in it. And that fatality and here, thing, go, well, go ahead, go ahead. Otherwise. Now, here we have the hanging woman, the woman hanging from this window. When you see the footage, he's filming for more than one minute, and she's still hanging on there. She's hanging on from a window ledge, and for a while with both hands, then she lets go of one of them. Oh. I'm telling you, that is a pretty strong woman. But then I, I went on Google Map and I checked out that exact window, and there are horizontal metal bars there that she could stand on. But the, I would suggest the way she's hanging out to the side, especially when she lets go of one hand, I mean, she's up there 10, 12, feet up in the air at least, no more, yeah, something like that. Uh, I, I would suggest there is a possibility if there's a wire or a harness involved or something like that. Because also here is the hero story, they always need the hero story. Yeah. And this woman turned out to be pregnant. It's also said that she shouts, that she screamed, help me, I'm pregnant. Uh, but uh, anyway, that a man, which I think looks like a woman that comes and helps her uh, and, and pulls her up so easily. But you see that the guy filming, he just moves away his camera so you can just see him being whoop, pulled up very, it looks a little odd to me. But after that, she went out on, on the TV saying, um, who saved me? Where's my hero? So the media went out there searching for the hero and they found him. But he only gave his first name because he didn't want to, you know, he was modest and so on. So there was this whole thing about the lost hero, she was pregnant, and he saved her from the bullets from the USA. Okay, possible, I don't know, but uh, anyway.
already, also we have the timing of the event because we need to look at what is the solution, what we have that the problem, we have our reaction. Right. So why were they doing this? And what is this solution that they're, they're offering us? And I would say that uh, uh, aside from some obvious things around this whole thing, with the bombings of Syria, the whole agenda of the New World Order to, to create and take over globally, in the global mass martial law, uh -huh. uh, and also use this to, to be part of creating a world army. We're not there to protect us, to control us. This is what they're trying to do now. Uh, there's also the thing that the, the G20 summit is ongoing. It, it started on the 15th of, of uh, November, and this is what they're trying to get our attention away from, because here is where they're trying to, to get these global laws in position, where we cannot get out of this strangula strangulation grip. Also, we have the Climate Change Conference that uh, is scheduled to begin in just a few days. That's and in then, Paris. It's in Paris. Sorry? Isn't that in, in Paris? Paris. And uh, uh, I keep forgetting his name. What's his name? The, the Bilderberger Vice President that uh, when it comes to uh, climate change, what's his name? Oh, uh, Gore, Al Gore. Al Gore, I keep forgetting his name, Al Gore. He had a live event, 24-hour live event, at the Eiffel Tower this very evening when this happened, so they canceled that. Uh, so here we have, they are set that the goal is trying to craft the legal binding universal climate change laws for the whole world in this meeting, at this meeting. And they have been fearing a lot of protests and demonstrations and so on, but no, due to these terror attacks, I'm sorry for our protection, we're not allowed to demonstrate. What do we mean? Martial um, law. It's martial law, yes. isn't it? They've closed it yeah. down for three months. So, could that be a coincidence or could it not? Now that, that's, I mean, you can stack up these coincidences, but once they get a little bit too high, we can't even... We can't even go there anymore. I mean, this is just too many coincidences lined up, especially disguising the G20 summit and the climate yeah. change summit. Do you know they had a, 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 I think it was the G8 summit that was just about to happen when the 7 7 bombings went off? I didn't know that. that. A coincidence. And at that meeting, they were planning. Uh, the idea was to let go of, uh, to cancel the debt on any African countries and set them free. But unfortunately, due to the, this terror act, the seven, the seven bombings, they canceled that and instead they totally focused on the war on terror and all of these anti terror. Yeah, so that was a bit of a for many African countries. But uh, can you handle a little more? Sure. Lay it on us. Lay it on us. <laughs> okay, no, there's, uh, there are some of these cafes, there's especially in the, um, um, what's the name of it? Uh, Le Petit Equipe, Le Bon Equipe, I think it's called. Uh, there's one, because the only surveillance cameras that was working this evening was, as far as I know, more or less at this little cafe. So that was very good because there were three of them on the inside, very good black and white, quite clear footage and so on, where you see the owner and some people on the inside, then there are some women sitting on the outside, and then you suddenly see the shooter, the car appear, and one shooter gets out, starts firing into this whole thing. And there's said to have been, I think, uh, I can't remember how many deaths, I think it was uh, 19, at least several. So we look at these uh, three different cameras, and it's very dramatic. Uh, you see they're sitting there, and suddenly you, you see these opening fire, or at least you see a lot of what looks like the breeze around in front of the camera flying around in the air. You see people running down, jumping, and throwing themselves on the table. And then the shooter comes up to one of the tables, aiming his gun at one of the women underneath the table, but then decides to leave her and walks away, and that's it. You also see the owner and some of the staff 
run down the stairs into the basement. And there's another hero story that the owner dragged out one of the women that had been shot in her canvas. So if we look at this footage, if you, you can find it on YouTube as well. If you look at the windows, look at the one to the far right. If you look at the other windows, they're a bit blurred, but that one is totally clear. Reason, there's no window in it. There's no glass in that window. Because when you see uh, the shooter, the car appears, he jumps out. When, when uh, there's a woman on the outside, and when the shots are starting to, when he starts firing, the woman who runs for cover, check out her left hand. She throws in a smoke grenade. You can see, if you go in slow motion, you can see that she throws it through this window where there's no glass. So it goes in and about one meter on the inside, it explodes, adding smoke to the whole thing. Then she runs in. The owner uh, uh, get, get, uh, leaves space behind the bar because he runs down into the basement. He does not save the employee. And the employee that is said to have been wounded in her left hand, you can see she just grabs on to the way and just runs down. No sign of, of that. Then you look at this debris is coming in from the camera. When you look from the other angles, because there are three different uh, cameras, then that debris that is said to have come from when the bullets hit the wall, uh -huh. that should come from the same place. But when you see from another angle, there's no debris where that other camera is. And it goes for all three of them. It's, but it's right in front of all three of them. This debris is very similar on all three. I would say either it's some kind, it, it blows in the, in the wind, it's some kind that it looks like so, what do you call it? Some, I don't know, flying thing. You know, either they added that as an effect afterwards, or, or it's something right in front of the camera. I, I don't know, it doesn't make sense at all. Also, when you check out the shoulders of this so-called woman who throws the smoke grenade, she is well built. I mean, she's got shoulders like a, a gladiator. <laughs> so I would suggest possibly a man in female right. clothes. Then you have the, the two cafes, uh, uh, Le Paris um, and Le Petit Cambodge and La, Le Carillon. They, these two I thought were in different locations, but they're right on the opposite street corners, very close together. And according to what I found out is that they've been closed both for a month or two before this happened. One of them, at least one of them, also changed owners right before this happened, one or two months before, uh, and got a huge owner. And the story there, uh, uh, the coming on, is that uh, this Jewish owner, his, uh, his uh, beautiful wife, she looks like a photo model, really getting the emotions going, was killed, leaving a six-year-old daughter, feeling the emotion. Please, no disrespect, if there are real victims, I totally apologize. Right. I just had to say these things out loud. And then there's several mentioning in the articles around this that the people working there were Muslims. So it doesn't make sense at all that Muslim terrorists shoots these Muslim people. At least I don't think so. But but this uh, the ownership, the change of ownership, and also the, these places uh, possibly being abandoned for a few months before this happened, may gives them, the attackers, total control of these locations. Oh, yeah. There's, there's one, for instance, you can see, if you look on Google Map, uh, you go down and you look at this street corner, check out the, the Le Carillon. And you will see that the billboard, or where the, you know where they write down the, the menu and so on, right, the, the, one, the blackboard. Menu, on like, the, yeah. Yeah, the two sides. And it's in the photo from Google Map is from June 2015, but it's exactly the same. It says the exact same thing as it does now in 2015. Same menu, and it says Wi-Fi as well. Exactly, it has, it's the same like six months later, is that possible? If this is a, a, a restaurant that is up and you're running? And then uh, in that area, I was looking around also, is there a possibility for logistics anywhere where they can control this operation? And right there on the opposite corner, there's an industrial estate with very 
very big uh, walls, you know, like uh, maybe six, eight feet high, ten feet high maybe. Uh, right opposite were gates and everything where there's plenty of, of parking space uh, and things inside of this dark, or I don't know what's inside this building, but a perfect location where nobody would, they could be sure that nobody would interfere or anything like that. So, Please. what do you think? Is it, can we believe the official story or, or do you think I made a point of assuming that this might be something else? Well, I think you've got, made more than one point, Oli. I think you've made a thousand. We've, we've watched them not kill people. We've watched them do these false flags. We've watched them cordoned off uh, streets like they did in Charlie Hebdo. They're the same M.O. over and over again. So when we say we don't know who died, we don't, we don't mean any disrespect if someone did, but we've been fooled so many times. We've been told that people die and then nobody, nobody, nobody ends up dying. So everybody should be just as skeptical as you are, and everybody should be looking at these things the way you do. But thank God for you uh, and all your research and all that you've done and uh, to, be, to bring these things forward and explain step by step. Here's how they do it. Here's how they did it the last time. Here's how they did it the time before. And then go through each of those so we can see that this is just another attempt. And I think this one is absolutely to, uh, to pull up a smoke screen to hide the G20 summit. The climate change summit, that's a thing that, that's going to really lock us down, I think. And, uh, yeah. the, and also you've got other, uh, there are several other countries where there's elections of, the, of different things, like in Denmark, uh, on the December the 3rd, there's a Europol, uh, do you know about the Denmark, how no. to join the European police state and, and so on, all of these things, and now because of all this terror, 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 you know, so they're doing it on multiple different levels. I also think that uh, it, one of the things that is new in this is, uh, at least to the amount we've seen this time, is the use of these foil blankets, you know, these emergency foil blankets, gold. So there's so many of these photos where there's bright gold, 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 uh, and, and there's a lot of things going on also with the markets and, and what, what they're trying to accomplish in the world. And I do remember on other programs I said that very often they carry these things out on a Friday, on a Friday afternoon and so on also. Because the reason for that is that then they can close the stock market for some two or three days out of respect for the dead and morning. Right. And then they have all of these insider trading of people who knew what was going to go, go down can make absolute billions and they've got the days to cover their tracks. Yep. Lock down currencies, make absolute bundles, and then one, two, three days later, they open up the stock market and no traces, no nothing. At least it's harder to find them. Because when JFK was taken out, they, were, they made an absolute fortune the powers behind it. The people who knew when 9-11, absolute fortune, when all of Parliament, the Swedish Prime Minister was taken out, it was the all-time high on the Swedish stock market. Okay. The things that we think are tragedies are super deals for these people, if you don't know about it beforehand. Right. And here, it was on a Friday again. And one of the first things Francois Hollande said, we will, not, we will close everything for three days. The exact number of days that they normally need for this type of operation. Amazing. Well, this has been a mind blower for me, and I'm sure it's been a mind blower for anybody else that's listening closely and paying attention to what's going on. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows your website so that they can go and support you there and also pick up some of these amazing publications you have there. Um, Oli, you want to give them your, your website and uh, talk a little bit about what's on there and what they can, what they can learn by going there? 
and show my website is lightonconspiracies.com light on conspiracy because that is exactly what I'm trying to do talking not violent but fearless exposure put that light in the darkest of the dark corners to expose <coughs> what is going on to expose the methods to expose the people or whatever they are, I mean, I'm really getting confused here because when you look at the madness, the level of madness, so I don't know. But anyway, that's the idea. And uh, I'm not funded, I'm not employed by anyone, it's not my job, I'm just an ordinary guy trying to do my absolute utmost to create a beautiful future for all of us. So uh, uh, if you want to follow and, and support me in what I'm doing, Please sign up for my newsletter. I have a monthly newsletter. Uh, there are donation buttons which are extremely appreciated because that is the thing that makes me be able to go and be on location just after these things happen or before and, and possibly being part of defusing it to stop this madness once and for all. Because I don't know about you, I am tired. After all of these years, I am so tired. I just want to have a cold beer, kick back, <laughs> back in the studio, make some music and enjoy life. So, uh, if you want to support me or support Paul and Mindy and these platforms that are the, the way forward at the moment, this is the, our chance. Main media, forget about it. Right. But the only reason to listen to that at all is to study the so-called enemies strategy right. and tactics. That's the only interest you can have in that nowadays because it is super controlled. Not that people that work there know about it always, very seldom, rarely, they, it's totally compartmentalized, but the owners and the information pumped out at you, at your children, and so on. I would very much suggest that there is a fantastic button on the remote. It is called OFF, sometimes yeah. it's red, if you press that, that could be a possible way of well-being. Instead of going to the spa, use that button and start feeling better. And if what I believe is happening now, we are at a battleground, really. It is like the dark and the light leading in a battle like never before, or at least not since Second World War. So it is a, a very intense battle. And the the people that are seen as enemies today are people like myself. I am what is being labeled as a terrorist. Now. Yeah. And I spoke to Scott, Scott Bennett, this guy from the, the I've told you about before, this high whistleblower, but way up in the US intelligence agencies and so on before. And I asked him, how do you and your former colleagues, how, did you, how do you see a guy like myself? I mean, it's interesting good question. to know for me because I'm receiving death threats and stuff, right. so it's just good to know what am I up against or what are, how am I being looked at. And he said that everyone with a clear mind, with a, a rational thinking, that can see beyond the veils of deception and connect the dots are seen as an enemy. And the higher up you are, the better you are at that you were being looked as a high-ranking officer of the enemy. I mean, this is the USA. Right. I'm not an enemy of the USA. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm just doing everything I can for humanity. And in, in this case, apparently, I'm looked upon as an enemy. So, but the thing that they fear is information. The truth, that is what they fear. That is why they want to label us terrorists. That is why they want to shut down the internet and limit our possibilities, uh, stop alternative media like this. We are changed. The org has just been banned in France. You know, they're now going through, they want to re-educate people, as it said, you know, so that we are not allowed to have opinions. And uh, after Charlie Hebdo, there was one female, um, some kind of, uh, yes, she was the Minister of Education in France, and she went out on a TV show saying that we now, we're looking at, we're trying to track down all the people who did not take part on the silent minute for the victims after Charlie Hebdo, so that they can be re-educated. I mean, my God, welcome to the Albanian wow. state of horror. That's right. What is that? But that is what we're up against. And 
I think people are saying, yeah, but uh, will we be able to in five years or ten years? It's not that, it's now. That's right. So I would, I would very much suggest now is the time to wake up. You're welcome to go back to sleep again afterwards if you want to, but here and now we need everybody to wake to what's going on. Wake up, take part of this whole thing, spread the real truth, do not buy into fear, don't support their efforts in destroying this world by just being quiet or, or, or do whatever they say. There's this slogan, you know, from this uh, brand that with these tennis shoes that was there, and it's in quite a few photos around this thing, this Nike logo. Uh, they have the, the, the slogan, just do it. I say, just don't. That's right. Yeah? Just don't. And uh, if it's okay with you, I would very much like, as always, to finish with a prayer. Love it. Love it. Okay, the prayer goes like this. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy and love and light. May everyone, and especially the ones who hurt us, be filled with peace and joy and love and light. The victory to that moment. Because we all need to heal. They need to heal as well. The people we look upon as monsters, or whatever they are behind this totally mad mindset that is behind this, it really is the same mindset as a cancer cell that kills the body that it's inside. So it's committing suicide at the same time. It is absolutely mad if you look upon it from a normal, rational way of thinking. They need to heal as well. Otherwise, this will continue. And we need to transcend this totally nonviolent. They're like poking us with a stick. They want us to get going. They want us to go out and throw rocks and Molotov cocktails. They want us to get curious. They want us to start beating up our Muslim um, sisters and brothers. They want us to attack each other, kill each other, so that they can use that as an excuse for martial law. Squash us. Totally control us. So the thing is, if that's their plan, it's turn it totally around. Let's start loving each other. Let's start caring for each other. Let's start being there for each other. Being there for your community, your family, your friends. Start seeing them instead of seeing them or being totally absorbed by this black box or whatever idol program. Or nothing bad about that, but wake up here and now. I thank you. And there was this beautiful thing I saw in there's this video from France where there's this young man. He's black, he's blindfolded, and he's put a sign on his chest and it says, I'm Muslim, I'm told I'm a terrorist. I trust you, do you trust me? If so, help me. There were hundreds and hundreds of people hugging him, you know, showing their support. And this is the way forward, I think. That was so beautiful, right. so at least I, I, I feel very deeply about these things. This is the way, and this is the we so-called weapon they cannot control. They don't have empathy. They don't have these feelings. They are right. very confused when we don't buy into their fear mongering. And when we suddenly do things like this, they arrange for all kinds of disasters, and suddenly people help each other. It's very confusing for them. So let's keep from confusing them. Do the absolute, absolute opposite of what it is they are trying to force on us. They want fear, we go for love. They want chaos, we go for calmness. They want divide and conquer, we go for unity. Perfect. Yeah, it's beautiful, they're helping us. But we need, it. this I'm, I'm telling you, at the moment I feel there's that the, the, it's the ultimate battle. This is the battle that we have been fearing or whatever. It's it, this is it. And I see the fellow researchers are, are you know people are, are being beaten up or scared away or attacked by many different odd things happening to them or getting very sick or dying from strange cancers or getting death threats. Or, this is it. 
this is not a time to chicken out. It's a time to stand in balance, in truth and in fearlessness. Very shit scary, shit right. scary, but we're here. Right. And why are we here? Because we've been totally branded and allowing this for such a long time because they are in the thousands. We are in the billions. What are we even here? I mean, I, I'm sort of one thing that gets to is like how much evidence is needed for people right. today. Right. No disrespect, or I must say disrespectful, yes, it's totally disrespectful because it's like, come on, my God. If you look at it, if this was on a t on TV and it was Colombo or something like that, and you had all these clues in one program, it would be, it wouldn't even be a program because right. you're saying that, oh, come on, it's just too bad. It's too much, it's ridiculous. And still, how dare you reach your critical finger? Well, I'm there because truth is the thing that leads me. And now I will be quiet. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was inspiring for us, and I'm sure it's inspiring for anyone who hears it. Thank you very much for spending your time with us, Oli, and giving us such deep, deep insight into what into the wool that they're pulling over our eyes. Thank you, Oli. My absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Okay, thanks.